and you have to make custom ads you know it's not like it's not the same thing as organic but literally it was just a video shot on my phone of just me being like hi like no music basically <laughs> like very home shot and that uh those did really well and i was editing all the videos myself things just started snowballing because the, the ads started doing well like you Welcome to the My Wife Quitter Job Podcast. Today, I'm thrilled to have Ann McFerrin on the show. Now, Ann is the founder of Glamnetic, a company that makes magnetic eyelashes. Now, Ann grew her magnetic eyelash brand to over $50 million in revenue. And yes, she started this in her bedroom in just a year and was doing seven figures per month. And today, we're going to learn exactly how she did it. So welcome to the show, Ann. How are you doing? Hi, thanks for having me, Steve. All those stories are true. Uh, my wife spends a lot of money on eyelashes. It's pretty ridiculous. I'd say eyelashes are one of the most expensive beauty. I mean, they're most, the most desirable thing, but also one of the most expensive parts of like the entire face, just because it it's very tedious to do. Um, you know, typically people go in for lash extensions, like you said, with a lash check, and then they spend like hundreds of dollars and they have to like literally lay there for an hour and a half. <laughs> it's really not pleasant. And then your lashes and your natural lashes end up falling off with it. So we, we really tried to figure out a solution. Um, and strip lashes are the other thing that you can do, but it's like glue is really, really difficult to work with. So that's why I was like, there, there's a gap here in the market for easy to apply strip lashes, but um, that are not necessarily glued on. So what's funny is like with, with my, my wife, like, after a while, they start falling out, right? And all of a sudden, they're like patchy. There's like this huge gap. And she's got to like do a comb over. <laughs> yeah. It's just... Anyway, yeah. Anne, uh, thank you for putting on your eyelashes. Your, your eyes look beautiful today. And uh, <laughs> what's funny, I was actually going to pick up some Glamnetics to surprise you with them. But my wife thought that was a little creepy, so I didn't do it. Uh, anyway, <laughs> how did you come up with the idea? Was it out of your own personal need or did you find like a gap in the yeah, it was a combination of both. Cause, so I've been wearing lashes my entire life, like basically since I was 17, like 16. And um, because I was the only Asian person in school, so everyone's eyes was like super big. And I was like, I want my eyes to look like that. And really like the only beauty product that would do that was lashes. Um, but they were really difficult to apply was the problem. Um, but I learned right taught myself how to do it and then literally every single day like i will you will not see me without lashes on um it was kind of an insecurity of mine to like just not have lashes on and then um basically fast forwarding you know i'm i have a lot of friends who are interested in wearing lashes and i always have to like help them apply theirs because they wouldn't know like for an event for anything and i was like this is really problematic why do people not understand how to do this um, around the same time, there's this like wave of awareness around um, magnetic lashes. So the the type that would, but they were the original like first prototype, which was the type that sandwiched your lashes in between two layers of magnets. So it was like the top layer had like three magnets and the bottom layer had three magnets, like maybe three magnets max, like not more than that, maybe like two. And I bought them and tried them and they just, I literally could not get them on for the life of me. And I was like, there's no way this is working. But I really like the idea of magnetic instead of glue. Like I'm like, okay, there's like, we're going somewhere, you know, away from glue, at least this is the only like in invention that I see like out away from glue. So I was like, how do we make this better? And so um, I started I, I guess something clicked in my head where I was like, what if I take glam magnetic, like glam lashes and make them magnetic? So turn them into glam magnetic lashes. That's actually where the name glamnetic came from. Um, and I just took basically a full strip of lashes that were like super full and fluffy. And then I told, I just started contacting factories and I was like, you guys need to glue like five magnets on it. You, you would not see um, magnetic lashes out there with more than three magnets at the time. So five was like a lot, right? Like people were like, the factories I asked, they were like, really five? Like, that's a lot. Um, and I would get all these samples back that look so wonky. The glue's not even dry, like falling off. And I got basically hundreds of samples from different factories and maybe two, you know, at the end of that, when that took like a lot of months, um, two came back and they were actually like high quality. So um, I, I started moving forward with that. And I was like, instead of having a layer sandwiching effect, I need to figure out something else. 
And um, I had seen a couple brands do magnetic liner, but they were not done well. Like it was in a pot form. It was in like this sort of pot form and you have to dip a brush and then like try to apply it and then it would it's be sad, like sad but really i understand weak exactly what you're talking about <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was a really weak hold so i was like this is not working so then i just sort of went back to the drawing table and i was like um ideally as a consumer i would love to have liquid a liquid version of that um and so then i just again started figuring out like so i mean i taught myself sourcing right. um product sourcing and then i just asked a bunch of factories to try to make this um and that's sort of how we came upon the final prototype and it just took took a year took over a year um i was doing it part-time while i was also painting like at night i was communicating overseas so i was just staying up late super, super late at night like communicating um on whatsapp yep, and yep, you know yep. all that stuff. I, I have to ask it this was, though uh you're Asian, and how did you not end up as like a scientist, an engineer, a lawyer, or a doctor? Okay. I'm an engineer. I had to give yeah. up that part of my career like five years ago, but it was tough. You know, funny part was I actually <laughs> almost I knew a it. doctor. I went to, <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> I went to UCLA for um, uh, psychobiology, which is like a pre-med degree that would like, you know, then you take um, the MCAT okay. and then yep. you go into, oh, it was a... Uh, yeah, it was basically pre-med. So I, I graduated and I was like, uh, this is not for me. I'm much more of a creative, you know, I was like left-handed. My mom was sort of like an artist and I love painting. So I thought uh, my calling was being an artist. I took like a couple art classes at UCLA and the classes at UCLA are insane because the professors there, you know, had shown at like the Hammer right. Museum and all this stuff. And so I was thinking, oh my God, like, this is my calling because I just had so much fun in the classes and also like really excelled there. Um, and I just had a really like natural gift towards visual arts. Um, and then I sold one of my first commissions, like before I even graduated, like for like $5,000. And I thought like, this is it, you know, like LA is it for art and I'm in the right place and why not try? And so I gave it a good try for, you know, four to five years. And your parents were cool um, with that? Being a um, they were, they were supportive. They were just saying, you know, as long as you can pay the bills and you can pay off your student loans yep. and all this stuff, cause I paid college a hundred percent, um, which I did. I got a part-time job <laughs> at, at like a laser removal <laughs> clinic while I was also nice. doing that, you know, so I was doing a bunch of stuff and then, um, you know, it kind of took off when I realized like a format that like people loved. And then, so I started doing paint like pet commissions cause everyone like wants their dog painted, so I just had like a bunch of them lined up, but then I was like literally at home all day paintings and my back started to hurt and I was like, I'm slaving away, you know? And then how did you become and, an artist um, to a business person though? It doesn't like, what is the path there? Yeah. So I, it kind of started with me just realizing that this is kind of a really lonely venture. Like I didn't really talk to anybody all day unless I had somebody at, over at the studio, my studio, AKA my right. bedroom. Um, and so I was like, I'm just like literally sitting at home all day. And that's the only way I could be productive was like being in front of a painting or a canvas. And I was like, this is really lonely. And I don't see myself doing this for like another 40 years. And if I don't see a, like a long-term path and also a way that I can accumulate like money at a faster rate, this is, this is not sustainable. Right. Okay. Um, and then I started meeting a lot of people that were doing e-commerce, yep. um, cause they were my clients buying my paintings. So I was like, and I started talking to them and I was like, the lifestyle that they had was amazing. They like, you know, can take meetings from home sometimes, like everything's kind of virtual and um, you see like consistent revenue coming in on a daily basis. And I thought about it too, because one of the things that I loved about being an artist was um, being able to create something and then making people emotional and, you know, affecting their lives in a way. And I wanted to figure out how I can do that on a mass scale. I can't do it just literally like eight hours sure, yep. of painting, like one by one, I can affect thousands of people if I'm creating a product, putting my creativity into it and then mass producing it infinitely. Um, so to me, it just seemed a no brainer that that was the, that was the business that I needed to put my effort because I, I could put my effort and time yep. into anything and potentially do well. So why not do it, do it to something that had better ROI and long-term scalability and like long-term lasting effects affecting more people. I was like, it just, yeah. it was no, 
So then I came up with that idea and I was like, I could not sleep. I like had to Well, do let's it. talk about the early years. So you mentioned it took you a year to get manufactured. Where did you find your suppliers? Did you like look on Alibaba or did you fly to China? How did, how did you do it? Yeah. Um, I mean, I went, I just Googled, honestly, like suppliers for um, lashes, magnetic lashes uh, in particular. Um, and yeah, Alibaba popped up and I looked on there and I was like, well, there's like so many suppliers on here. And um, every one of them did not have what, the, what I wanted. So the only way that I could do it was I needed to find a supplier that can do magnetic and also do um, like strip like glam lashes. And so I would find those suppliers and figure out, I'd be like, okay, you guys mix this method with this method. Were um, you a designer or do you just kind of verbally tell them like, this is what I'm trying to do. Can you guys make a prototype? Yeah, I would draw, I would provide them with a okay. drawing because I was an artist too. So I was like, oh, yeah, I that's just right. draw it out. Okay. Yeah, that helps. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, exactly. But it wasn't too hard to, I mean, it's just like literally take the lash, put the, put the magnet on it and um, just make sure. And then like, it needed to have a magnet like case that had you know so designing the case was also important um and so yeah when we came out with it like it just blew people away i think because it just wasn't on the market what was preventing the existing magnetic lash makers from just putting more magnets on or is there a lot more to it um i it's just they just didn't think okay. about it. it they just didn't i don't know why i was thinking that i was like this is so obvious to me but to them obvious i mean it wasn't because it's they're not selling it sure. right like i really come from the perspective as a consumer as a lifelong consumer and, and an expert in my own right of lashes and then um also like being younger i think i think a lot of these founders were a little sure. older um and so i was like it, understanding trends i think a lot better and um i'm in la so yeah. it's just like you kind of just understand that a lot more and then all my friends are using it so i got a lot of different feedback from them that was really helpful presumably you didn't have much money when you first started this so what was like your first order like what was the minimum order quantity yeah um it was like a hundred oh that's it okay <laughs> yeah it was like a very small amount per and we did like five we did five styles okay so and yeah, they all started with the letter L, um, but they were bigger. So I was, I was, I was sort of going towards what I liked, uh, which was like more glam full lashes. And then later on, I real, I did realize that people prefer natural. So then I started launching more natural stuff. But um, yeah, initially I went out the gate with sort of like medium to long lash styles. Um, but because the technology, like the uh, sort of application methodology was so like innovative i think that's why it sold out so then yeah once that sold out was when i re rebought like a bigger yeah, of course. order do you, you remember know? how much you spent like yeah. per unit on like that first order <laughs> yeah it was like around three, three dollars per three, four okay dollars. so really small you didn't need a lot of money at all to start this yeah like just for the lash and then you have to buy the liner separately so it was like yeah but it was it just took some time to scale you know what i mean like you i, I wanted to go in because we it's like fully self-funded so like i didn't raise any money um i wanted to go in just being sure that we were going to sell it. i didn't sure. want to like be stuck with a lot of inventory like put a lot of money out the door so trying to really do it slow and steady i was like there's no rush i you know my goal initially was like i'd be happy with ten thousand dollars a month in revenue that's how like, we that always start right <laughs> Uh, we were happy with five thousand a month in the very beginning. Also, yeah. Yeah, I was like, no, I was like ten thousand a month revenue. I'd be happy. Yeah, that was that was my starting point. So we surpassed that the first month, and I was like, Whoa. yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's nice about your lashes is they don't take up much space. I can't even imagine ordering a container of lashes, right? You're probably ordering in these small packages that were just air shipped <laughs> to you, right? Yeah, um, and then we used a 3PL, um, third third party fulfillment center, and then they basically stored it, and then. And then they shipped it out for me. And it was so funny because I had so very little units because they're used to dealing with yeah, bigger yeah, fish, you know? And I'm over here like, you guys lost two of my lashes. <laughs> and I was like, I was like calling the girl every day, like the, and she was like so annoyed with me probably because I was like calling because I saw like five missing from the the warehouse and i was like where did the five go where did you guys take it like did you guys steal it like <laughs> steal your lashes <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, it was, you know, when you only have a hundred per lash, I was like, you gotta, it's, it's valuable. Yeah. Now it's like, I can't even, I don't think we can even keep track of yeah. how many. Okay. So walk me through the progression. So you order your first 105 styles and then those sell out real quick. And then your second order, did you order like significantly more? Um, yeah, like 500. 500. Okay. So it really was a gradual yeah, so progression. The rate of sales was a little faster than I thought. So there was like, we could stop, stock up a little more. And then and um, immediately you use the 3PL or did you first fulfill out of your own bedroom? I never fulfilled out of my bedroom. I just, I didn't want to ha I, like, sure. deal with the hassle of pack packages. I was like, I need to focus on scaling this, marketing this digitally, which I recommend to uh, all founders is just start with a 3PL off the bat because they actually save money because you, um, they have a better shipping right. rate than if you were to like ship yourself so it's like what's the point well, um, you know how did you find your first 3pl like today there's a they're a dime a dozen but it, and it's pretty hard they all look the same right yeah um well so basically i i took a business partner on like basically so kevin gold um after the first month of sales i had met him and he was like oh i want to help you with like you know all of the back end stuff infrastructure and um i was like okay cool like i can basically focus on marketing creative product like all the stuff i want to do and then um he had a 3pl he had, was already okay. working with and the, the other brand that he owns so he was just like okay let's just use them cuz we already like using them and they're they're good so we ended up going with with shipmunk okay sh oh shipmunk okay so it's like a mainstream one yeah i've, I've heard of shipmunk uh, so yeah. in, in terms of I mean, it, what's nice about your stuff is it's so light like the 3PL really makes sense for you. Uh, would you have done anything different if your items were larger? Um, you still I would still use the 3PL? Use the 3PL. Yeah, because I mean, you don't want to, even if they're like, if they're heavier, it's actually worse because you gotta, you're like, gotta carry Oh, all yeah, that yeah, yeah that's true. To... That's true. Well, <laughs> how did you decide on your margins? So you were getting these, you said, for like five bucks. Uh, what were they selling for when you first launched? Oh, um, I mean, $30. $30. I think that's typical for lashes. Yeah. It's typical for lashes, like, and we had to pay more because of the magnetic sure. component. They were all hand glued. Right, right. They're all handmade and hand glued. So it's like they're more like premium lashes. And so, yeah, just hand gluing everything. It just takes so, so much time. And then, like, they're going in there and hand making it. It's not machine made, like, um, sort of drugstore brand. Did you ones. have in mind, like, certain margins that you were only willing to sell them at? Not necessarily. I mean, I think we just went in. I wanted to see what comps were in the in the marketplace at the time. That was like the comps. Um, I didn't want to go like there were comps that were way more expensive than what we were selling out. Like we were trying to go towards like sort of the lower end, but everyone was going like crazy, but just because it was such a new product. Right. Okay. Um, but also it, it is a high quality lash, and so, um, and then with factoring in marketing, you have to spend so much on marketing. You have to like make sure that you do figure out how to get obviously the highest margin possible, but also be competitive. It's, that's a really tough, tough thing to crack, you know, like when you're, when you're kind of starting a new product, you're like, where do I, like, what do I charge sure. for this? What, like, what makes, like, what moves for you? You know, um, we actually started off at a higher price and then like lowered it okay. uh, a little later. Uh, how did you guys do quality control? Yeah, so it because they were very minimal co like orders, we would just have it shipped to my place. I would check them each of the boxes, but then like once it started getting to like thousands of units, it was like a lot harder. It was like spot checking. We were like, okay, well, so you check just put them whatever. on. Like I could see these old Chinese ladies like putting them on. Okay, these are good. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, and I would tell the the factory to send me like basically a bunch of. Uh, their QA videos and so they'd send me like hundreds of videos of just like them testing out different lashes making sure the magnets are not falling off right and all these things that was a like a bigger problem in the beginning now now it's um now it's probably smooth. smooth now we have a company that does it overseas right before it even leaves the port yeah same here we, we have someone actually inspect every single piece it's actually pretty reasonable uh, before they're even yeah. shipped do you have multiple factories or are you still using the original ones that you started with no, no, yeah. Now we have completely shifted. Um, we're like way more advanced with like the factories that we're working with. There's like a bigger criteria like for quality, and then um, we have somebody go and inspect the factory before we even work with them. They do a full audit report. It's like, yeah. And then we have six different factories we're talking to. Nice. 
um, in case like one of them doesn't come through for something we have you know we have it somewhere else and yeah and then we have the QA company like it's a whole thing it's a whole it's become a whole yeah massive. do you ever have to go over there or no um I could never because it was COVID like That's they right. were shut down That's right. and still shut down it's crazy it is actually yeah I wanted to go check out the factories but we actually um we just hired somebody to go over there who could actually go into the country okay so we hired and then we would have her call from the factory and we'd meet the like owner and stuff like that all right let's talk about the interesting stuff how did you generate sales like your first sales how did you generate those yeah it was very like guerrilla marketing initially well, we were literally i mean it was just me on the team when i say we but <laughs> initially um i just dm'd like every customer that was following us on instagram um, and I just, I would be like, Hey, um, how are you? Thanks for following us. Uh, you know, and then I would ask them if they've ever heard of magnetic lashes, if they've ever tried magnetic lashes, a lot of them that would be like, yes, I've heard of it and never tried it, but, or yes, I have tried it, but yours looks different. Um, and, and I would just hear what people had to say about the product. And then I would, um, just ask them if, they'd like to try it. I, I would like, I'll give you a 20% off discount code with like a custom discount code. And I would like make their, like whatever their name was, I would make that and Shopify. How did you start that initial Instagram account? Was it about Glamnetics or was it your own personal account? No, it was a, uh, it was a different account. It was actually a meme account initially that um, I converted over. Like I didn't know like I basically wanted to get traffic, so I had made a meme account. Okay. And so it was like good to get traffic, and then I started switching the content over. So like our initial few thousand were like from that, and then I switched it over. Memes to for like fashion, beauty, or um, it was no, it was, yeah, it was for beauty. It was for okay. beauty, like got it. Meme. And so you were DMing everybody. Interesting. What was your hit rate? Oh, it was pretty high. Really? I, like very... I, I guess uh, attractive female DMing people would probably work better than like a dude doing it, right? <laughs> well, I mean, they don't know who's DMing. They, I just said that I, w I would say I was the founder, so they would be like excited about uh, that. Okay, got it. Um, but Or I would act like I wasn't the founder because it makes us look bigger. But I'm not. It's like I'm not the founder. But right, right. But I would, yeah, I would just talk to them about the product and like try to understand what they're looking for and then help guide them. I was sort of like a personal shopper, I guess, for my own products. And, but I was literally like on DMs the entire day, like eight hours a day, like wow. just DMing like every single, cause it was just endless, you know? So, um, that was enough to sell out your first batch, the DMing strategy. Um, yeah, that's impressive. Okay. I, I'll tell you a story about mine. Uh, like when I first started selling, if someone abandoned their cart, like I would stalk people. And as soon as they abandoned their cart for like 15 minutes, I would call them on the phone because I already got their number. And they'd be like, wait, wait, what, what's going on here? Why are you calling me? I'm like, oh, I just noticed that, you know, you didn't finish your transaction. Is there anything I can help you with? And if I got them on the phone willing to talk to me, I closed them like 90% of the time. So oh, wow. I can see why your strategy works. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because you just, I think people just want to feel like they're, being, obviously, if you're shopping for anything, they want to feel like you care and like that you care about them and that you have their best interests at heart. And so trust, building trust is like really important. Um, and so I think it was, a, you were able to do that if you're like having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. I'd send voice memos sometimes like just to make it feel like it was real, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I just, I also, it was a good way for me to understand like what the customer wanted. So I would figure out like, oh, I would get feedback on a purchase and they'd be like, Oh, I had to trim them. And so we started pre-trimming the lashes because that was a big problem. Cause people were like, I don't know how to trim these they are magnet. They're magnetic. So they're thinking that they can't trim them because they're, they have magnets on them. Uh, so then, okay. Okay. Let me pre-trim them. So we were like the first pre-cut lashes. And then I started adding more magnets. Um, so we were the first six magnet lash um, brand. And then like, yeah, it just got a little, you know, each time more dialed in on in terms of what the customer needed. Right. Okay. And then that took you so far, maybe like your first and second batch. When did you start doing less, uh, less intensive methods to market? Yeah, we started basically, you know, I hired like a, uh, I <laughs> hired someone from Upwork to help with like Facebook ads. Okay. Like so you started running Facebook ads right away. Were you 
profitable? Like, were you making money at that point before you started running the ads or? Um, yeah, we were, yeah, we were, we were good. Like in terms of there's no, there was no overhead because it was just me initially. But then obviously we, as we started hiring people, it became a lot more sure. intensive and like very expensive and then marketing as well. Like spending, spending all the, all the money on ad spend on Facebook was just really like a lot, you know? Was that your first person that you hired someone from Upwork to run your Facebook ads? Yes, that was okay. that, that was like literally our first like real employee. Okay, wow. Okay, so you just found someone on Upwork and then I don't know if you remember this, but were you trying to just break even? Were you trying to make money? Like what was your what was your goal with the ads? I mean, we didn't we didn't know what we were doing like the the ad buyer knew more. He had more experience and um, so he was sort of like teaching me like how everything worked. He had ran um, for some other companies as well in the past. And you have to make custom like ads, you know, yep. it's not like, mm -hmm. it's not the same thing as organic. Yep. Uh, it's not the same thing as like a TikTok or a reels. It's like, you have to make custom things. So I'm like literally over here, like shooting, like talking to the camera, being like, Hey, like this is how, you know, I'm like explaining the product. Yeah. I'm like, hi, I'm Anne, founder of Glamnet. I didn't know what else to do. So I was like, I guess I'll introduce myself in front of the camera. So I was like, hi, I'm Anne, I'm the founder and CEO of Glamnetic. Um, if do you struggle with lashes because magnetic lashes, you know, basically and I'm over here like showing them, you know, you just apply the magnetic eyeliner and then you magnetize the lashes and that's how you apply our lashes and people would freak out. Like, I don't know, like I believe it. Stuff. Yeah. But literally it was a, it was just a video shot on my phone of just me being like, hi, like barely any music in the background, like no music basically. Yeah. Literally, like very home shot. And that, uh, those did really well. Um, and I was editing all the videos myself initially, and then I hired a video editor again on Upwork. And so it was just, um, and then he was just asking me for like a bunch of assets and he would run them. And then, um, and then yeah, it, things just started snowballing because the, the ads started doing well. Like he was able to keep like putting spend behind the ads. Yeah, your and product is perfect. It It's half the population needs it. I have this student in my course that sells these inserts that let you wear high heels longer and that killed in Facebook ads. It's doing something similar to what you were doing. Just coming on, just telling what the benefits are. Yours it's is much more visual heels. too. It's amazing. What is it? It's high heels. Oh, it's this thing that you, are you interested in? No, uh, just... <laughs> no. uh, it's just something you add to your shoes so you can wear high heels longer without being painful. Oh, is it called pre heels? Uh, pre heels is the spray. I, I can't believe I know all this stuff. Pre heels is the spray. But yeah, Pre Heels is another friend actually who started that company. Yeah, there's a bunch of them now, but yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it's like you just figure out a problem that's like a really common problem and you fix it and that's... Yeah, that's cool. And then, okay, so you started with Facebook ads and were you still doing the DMing at that time or, or were you just... Yeah, I was okay. like, well, this is good, you know, good revenue to just do DM, so let's just keep doing it. Um, yeah. Started I started actually um, getting interns. Um, like at first, it was ingenious. Tell me about that. Actually, so mate would do it. Okay. Um, and my and then I met this girl at UCLA as well, and she was looking for an internship, and I was like, okay, like you can help me with this. And then we just you know started building like a whole team of girls that were just helping like DM sales, and they they would have schedules that they would come on and like do it, and I would train them. Um, and, and then, yeah, and then while ads are being ran and then it just, and then I'm, I'm working on product. Like I'm thinking future and like, I'm trying to figure out like, how can we continue to scale? How do we continue to improve the products? Because each time we do a reorder, we can improve the product and fix it, you know? Um, and so it's getting all the feedback from the DM girls and being like, okay, what else can we fix? Um, after a certain point, you run out of things to fix. You're like, okay, well, I think this is pretty good. Um, yeah. But yeah, so that's kind of sort of how I was thinking, and then, and then, and then customer service was a whole nother thing. Like I was doing customer service, and I was like, I need to hire someone else to do this because it's getting crazy, um, and I want to be able to. I I feel bad personally, and so I would literally like voice memo the the customer or myself and run to the post office myself to like ship stuff out. Like I'm like, okay, I'm sorry, and fix. Like I'm I'm going to fix your defective eyeliner. You know, like just all these things and I was freaking out like personally a lot if like there was a like a defective anything I would be like oh shoot this sure. 
Yeah. And so it was stressful. That part was stressful because I was like, I don't really want to feel like so much emotion from just like customer service. Um, and so then we we started hiring out for that. Like, I just want to know the order of your hiring. So you hired someone to do Facebook ads, but that was sounds like that was a contractor. Your first employees were like interns, it sounds like, from, from school. Yeah. And then you went to customer service to offload that. And presumably that was probably enough to take you to like a couple million bucks a year or, or more. So we started, yeah, it was like, it was a weird snowballing effect. So we launched July, 2019 and then end of July, like July 31st, so basically August. And then, um, like we just doubled, like started doubling our revenue every single month. Um, like mostly Facebook or it was Facebook and Instagram, like running Facebook and Instagram. And Instagram. Um, I like the talking videos. Yeah. Um, of just me. And so then my face was like running everywhere. And then people were like recognizing me as like the glamour. Oh, is that right? Okay. Um, and then, yeah. And then basically like that Black Friday was when we started doing like major, major numbers, like seven figures. And then um, seven figures a month. And then, and then, yeah, January. And then after the stimulus check, it hit. It's just yeah triple i think everyone felt that um so i wouldn't say it was like a hundred percent you know just i mean obviously we did really good at marketing and but i think like every brand went up 3x just that year from like the stimulus checks hitting yeah it was or, glorious yeah, yeah. right you felt that. <laughs> yeah uh, every okay so founder that i talked to was like whoa but like because that was our first year it just really blew up. I mean, the combination of the product being amazing and just the marketing really hitting and then literally through these freaking talking videos. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. With, like, I, no I guess it's background, nothing. It's just like, hi, I'm Anne, founder CEO of Glamnetic. You like <laughs> Like your voice got a little higher when you did that too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So were you doing like email? Like how much of your business was repeat business? Yeah. So yeah. We, and that was a whole nother thing. I, I was doing also emails, emails, on okay. social media. So it was like, and then I was like, okay, I need to figure, I need to hire someone because it's getting crazy. Cause I'm like also trying to like edit the graphics. So and then I hired my first employee. Her name was Mia. She was like our first like real actual employee. The other people were sort of like, con like, you know, like uh, overseas Contractors. or con yeah. yeah. Like the interns are part time and some of them were volunteers. So it was like, okay, first real employee. Like, and so, I think she was probably confused. She showed up. She thought I was like, oh, Glamnetic HQ, you know, and it's literally my bedroom. Oh, get out of town. Okay, so you, your first hire was working out of your bedroom? Yeah, it was literally like right before Black Friday. I hired her uh -huh. in November. And then, um, and then I remember her helping me with like all the assets and stuff because she like was an editor. She knew how to use Photoshop and stuff. So she was like, I was teaching her how to edit like Photoshop stuff. Now she's a video editor full time, but before yeah she was like doing everything she was doing that and then she was helping me with customer service and i was like teaching her how to do all this stuff but yeah it was very disheartening because the first three people that i had hired uh before her they quit like in like the second day or like oh two, three, like, maybe a weekend and then he's like, like oh sorry i took another job somewhere else just because it was like first of all i couldn't offer that much pay just because i like we sure. were just starting off and then um also like they were coming into my house and it was like which is kind of yeah they're yeah. just like this is weird <laughs> like this, well it's dangerous it too for nice you house. i would think it was like a korea town yeah. back house of a house <laughs> okay <laughs> 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 this is great, by the way. I love it. I love these stories. Okay. My business partner, literally, I remember him seeing where I lived for the first time, and he was just, like, judging me. <laughs> he was like, oh. And I was like... Well, how did you get Mia to stay, then? Uh, where did you find her? Um, Where did she stay? Well, I found her... I think it was on... Oh, yeah. The other people I found on Craigslist. I think that was a problem. But I okay. found her on... Yeah, I found her like through a friend. So she was a friend of a friend. Okay, a referral, nice. Yeah, she and, she, and she, my friend was like, oh, she, you know, Mia's just graduating. She's looking for a job, like to get just experience and stuff. And because it was a referral, I think she felt a little bit more like right. comfortable, obviously, <laughs> coming into my house and stuff. Um, but then eventually we did get an office like maybe two months later. Okay. But it was fun. Yeah. I loved that little back house. I my upstairs. It was like a back house of a Korea town house, 
Um, right. And it was a two story back house. So it was actually a big, bigger back house. And then um, I would live downstairs. And then upstairs, there was like a living room, small living room. And I turned that into like my photo shoot studio. So I would, cool. I would do photo shoots with her in there. And like my, I would teach my roommate how to also help us take photos. And then we just, it was very slapdash. You know what I mean? Like we were all yeah. trying to figure yeah. it out. Um, I can just imagine interviewing for that job. Hey, hey, why don't you come to my little Korean outhouse over here? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. All right, well, let's, let's talk about, let's talk about scaling. Uh, so you got to like, it sounds like $10 million that way. And then now you're at 50 plus, uh, you'll probably have an incredible Black Friday this year too. Uh, walk me through like the infrastructure you had to put in place because it, it, it's very uncomfortable to grow quickly, right? Yeah, I mean, it just it just takes. I mean, honestly, this past year, past year and a half has been really tough because of the iOS updates. Like, I don't think any brand out there is like doing yep. great. In fact, I think most brands are probably going to file for bankruptcy. Very scary. Um, but yeah, it's it's like even just to survive and stay at the same level is really hard as like you are doing the year that the stimulus checks hit just because that year was just an anomaly. Um, yep. And yeah, after the iOS updates, ads just didn't perform as well as they used to. It's way more expensive now to acquire customers. I think brands are now finally facing the reality of what it's like to really run a brand and how difficult it is. The employee expectations and expectations for salary are not adjusted to that just because they're like oh inflation so therefore like shouldn't we get paid more you know what i mean but it, yeah but in reality like everyone's doing worse so it's just like a really weird time right now but yeah i mean have you guys shifted over to like google google probably doesn't work i mean search we basic. honestly yeah. shift i mean even that it's like i think every every platform is hard um right now yeah. it used to be way easier like literally 10 times easier like that's how different it is um just because overnight of this update it's crazy like you would never right. expect that to just take the toll that it did but apple literally single-handedly wiped out i feel like a bunch of small businesses and i don't think i mean it's like the best <laughs> it's literally the best marketing tactic of all time because they're like oh we care about your privacy but actually we're just wiping out a bunch of small businesses uh, yeah, so I mean, yeah, this year we just kind of shifted, like the last year and a half, we shifted our strategy towards retail. Oh, nice. So, okay, that has its own headaches too, right? I would imagine. Yes, it's much more intensive logistically, yes. Um, but it's like at least a lot more guaranteed money than like running ads. It's very, sure. it's very hard to be profitable on running ads. In yeah. fact, you can expect to lose money now running ads. It's, it's actually right. And then make up for it on the back end, like selling multiple items or, or something like that back end. Um, like in terms of upsells? Upsells are just once you have that customer, like you sell other stuff now too, right? So just because you're losing money on the front end getting that customer, like the lifetime value of that customer hopefully is much higher than what you paid for them, right? Yes. Um, it's So the problem with a lot of customers nowadays as well is like they're not necessarily loyal to a brand like from the first purchase. So you got to get them to come maybe three, four times. And then that's when they become more loyal. But like the first purchase, people are always like just trying stuff out or whatever, you know? Yeah. So it's really hard to get like super brand loyalty unless you get them on the third, third, fourth time. But I would say like typical repurchase rate for most companies is like maybe like we're, we're above average for that. We're above average for, for what it. What are you at actually? I'll tell you what mine is. Yeah, we're like, I mean, it depends on the cohort, right? So like, I don't know if you guys look at that, like cohort data. So it really depends on the cohort because like retention for Black Friday customers is way lower than- Oh yeah, of like, course. Yes, yes, so yes. So it's, yeah. it's kind of hard to just say a general number. Yeah, so we, and then we don't even look at cohort data. I mean, we look at it for Black Friday and stuff, but we just know that that's not like typical because they're just in for the sale and then out. Um, yeah, cool. I mean, it, it's pretty amazing what you've done. Uh, and, and I love hearing stories of like how crazy it was. Like, I remember like when we first started out, like there was a customer that was local. We do weddings and she ordered last minute. So I literally like, drove it out to her wedding. I mean, these are the things that you do in the beginning, right? Like the hustle stuff that people don't it's the hear most about. the fun part of, I literally would go back anytime and relive it again just because it was 
it was so intense and but yet so fun like I remember I had an emergency situation where I was like I literally had to order um I had to order stuff from from my factory like unboxed like like unpackaged because it would take them an additional 12 days to package it and I was like I, can't, I don't have that time we need it now and so I literally just invited a bunch of my friends over for like a, and like for pizza I'm like can you guys help me package <laughs> these boxes and we literally just had a pizza party and then just we're like packaging these boxes together and it was so funny like it was so fun though but like I would never forget that day you know what I mean like we ended up staying until like 2 a.m to like package these boxes and I was like thank god I have cool friends who are like down to help me and be there for me whenever I needed them so I was like really grateful for that <laughs> it's like note to listeners if Ann calls you over for dinner <laughs> you better <laughs> be ready to pack boxes uh, um, I feel like they're so used to it right now like the other day like this past weekend I had to film I was trying to film a new series on TikTok where it was like asking strangers to test the strength of our press on nails and I was like having cars run over our press on nails like different cars so I was like having to borrow different friends for different their cars and I was like hey like can I use your Tesla today can I use your whatever like <laughs> you stay in the car and drive it I will just you just need to run over this nail they're like what <laughs> <laughs> no that's cool that's so it sounds like you've expanded the product line you're doing nails lashes liner and all that stuff which is probably helping the top line as well Nails really took off uh, for us, yeah. Cool. Let me ask you this. Uh, there's a lot of people listening to this who want to probably start a business and they probably don't like their jobs. Uh, some of them are probably pre-med, lawyers and whatnot. So what, what advice would you tell these people uh, given your experiences? Yeah, it's def definitely like one of those things where you have to be 100% all in on it like, and just feel sort of like that map like passion that motivation I I definitely rem like I felt this crazy crazy like passion for it when I when I had first started I literally was like I can't like I can't eat sleep breathe like without thinking about this um and and I I know that a lot of people are kind of on the fence they're like I'm not sure if I really like I'm into this idea or am I not like I don't really know if you're feeling that way like you should try to find an idea where you feel like sort of that same way because otherwise if you don't believe in it full like wholeheartedly it's really going to be hard to kind of stay motivated and like pushing this product because if you don't believe in the product like no one will you have to be the biggest ambassador for it and you have to be the one that's like the most vocal about it like all of my friends and everybody who follows me knows I like shout about Glamedic every single day and it's it's a marathon not a sprint as well although I definitely much treated like I treated it like a sprint the first year and a half and you sort of yeah. have to the first year of starting a business is like the most intense it requires it's like having a newborn child right it's like it just requires way more effort than you ever think that it would require and so just having the willingness to I didn't realize you were a mom no I'm not a mom I'm not a mom Say, oh, I would say, okay. So, so you're one of those types of people that say, oh, it's like having yeah, a kid. Yeah, because I've heard it from other people and I, <laughs> yeah. I'm saying it because you you have kids and just, right. I'm sure you can. Uh... So I didn't mean to make fun of you. I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding with you. Yeah, go. <laughs> I'm like, no, not ready for that yet. Cannot. I can't even take care of myself right now. I'm like, oh, you're um, yeah, so I think, I think just making sure you really tap into that part of yourself and like really like do some soul searching before like you start that hey, this is something I'm really like willing to commit like through hard times, through the good times. And I think also timing is just important as well. It's, I mean, it's really hard to time it. I think we got in at a really good time, you know, starting starting the brand. Um, I mean, starting it in an economic downturn could be a good thing, but it's just figuring out ways out besides doing ads. Like if you can really kill it on organic and you understand content yeah. marketing really well, that's where you're going to have an advantage right now, just because honestly, ads are not doing well. So the only thing that you can really do is try to push things through organic and meaning trying to go viral on reels and TikTok. So really understanding how to do that, I think for your brand is going to be a big, big win, because also that's how like retailers are going to spot you. You know, if you go viral organically on TikTok um, and stuff like that for your product, that's how like these, all these retailers are gonna see you and like reach out and like wanna work with you. Like Ulta saw us 
and they like wanted to reach out. Like, they nice. wanted to work with us, which we didn't have to reach out, which was great. And it started sort of the snowball effect of us working with Sephora and like, you know, and then now they're like fighting for us to like get exclusives awesome. and stuff like that. So I think it's just, um, yeah, it's like one of those things you just kind of have to make sure you're a hundred percent in it um and focused and once you have that that passion like everything else follows i like i would say that like emotion leads everything you know so having that emotion yeah. is really important going into it because otherwise you're just not going to put your 100 percent. you're going to make excuses otherwise you're not truly feeling it that's what that personally for me that's what it is if i'm like going into something and i'm not 100 percent like passionate about it i'm just going to make excuses to like not do it yep Actually, every successful business I ever started was during a downturn. Actually, I think I think it's good to start a business during the downturn. Things are cheaper. Is, yeah, uh, yeah. Labor should be cheaper, and uh, yeah, I, I hear you on the passion. In that first year, I remember we'd stayed up nights and weekends, just working. But it was fun. fun. Like I, I didn't mind it at all. I would come home working a ten-hour day, and then I would sew for two hours. We had an embroidery. Oh my machine. god. Yeah, yeah, it's like when you yeah, love something, I literally was like, I, I could keep doing this forever. Like, I, that's what I felt like. I, it was like for the first time I felt like a sense of purpose, you know, and that I never really felt that even in painting. I was like, I was good at it, but I was just like, I just didn't feel like this was necessarily my purpose for some reason. But here I was like, for some reason, I feel like it is. I just feel like I'm making more of an impact. I feel like because I get so many comments from people after they use a product, they're like, you changed my life. Like I can finally apply lashes like, or, you know, they're allergic to lash glue and they were never able to use lash glue. And now they can use my product um, or, or people who have alopecia. Like there was just a lot of like life changing moments that people would message me about. And I would be like, wow, this is amazing. Like that was one of the best parts of, I think being an e-com founder and getting those messages back. It just felt like you're doing something good. You know, did you quit? all together to start your thing like did you have any source of income before you started your business um i mean it was the art it was the the painting the commissions i basically started stop i start i stopped painting the commissions it just took i mean it took a long time to complete okay. the painting i would i would do it some like here and there if i really needed the money and stuff but um i was just like i'm all in you know I was, right but you had a backup plan yeah i always i mean i always felt Worst like case. i was gonna be i literally blew up my account multiple times um trading like i was also doing day trading and stuff like that um, <laughs> okay before, before, that's a separate story and i yeah. it was just this tumultuous like emotional roller coaster because i was day trading for like a year and a half like a pretty long time and i was trying to take it really serious and try to go all in, in it as well like, i don't know how to not go all in on stuff that i like i'm really into so i started like finding day traders in california that um, could, could teach me that were really good. And I met up with them and I would like go to their, like, I would meet up with them like 5 a.m. and like figure out how to trade and stuff like that. It was just really grueling though. I ended up blowing my account like a couple times. And I day traded for a year too. I, I couldn't sleep at night yeah. because I would wake up at, at market open and, and just like that market open, it determines so, like your whole mood for the it's day. It's so stressful. Yeah. Like you're just like literally a mess, you know, like, I, yeah. my sleep patterns were messed up. I was like, this is literally affecting my health. You know, like it, it's just really, it's really bad. So that's what I wanted to get away from as well. Uh, on top of the art, I was like, everything's just sort of like a roller coaster. Um, so I'm like, I need to really figure out how to like get stability here. And building a brand really is sort of that. It's like you were building that foundation and then it's like, it's slow and steady, yeah. but it's, it's really freaking hard. But it's so worth it, in my opinion. I th I wouldn't do anything else. Uh, just last question. Like, walk me through your day to day now. Uh, is are things much better now? Yeah, I have offloaded. I mean, we have like ninety employees now, so it's, wow, nice. Yeah, it's a lot. I mean, we share a back end with because my business partner has like another brand, and so we share the sort of like ops infrastructure with them. So then it's sort of like you know we're each paying for half. And so it just makes right. everything like a lot more efficient. So yeah, a lot of those tasks are offloaded now. I don't do customer service anymore. A social media team. We have. Right. A, we also have like leadership team. So like a head of every department, and that's just helped tremendously. Like basically, I'm sort of overseeing strategy on like social and and like steering product in the right direction, coming up with new product ideas, and then sort of helping them through the development phase of it. But I'm not like in the weeds anymore. 
on it cool. on much. Uh, I'm still very much in the weeds on social, though. I am now, like, basically taking over social and shoot and trying to shoot. Because it's very hard to go viral on TikTok. It's really hard to, like... It used to be easy. It's harder now. It's really hard yeah. now to hire someone to just do it and, like, be smart enough about content where they're going to come up with clever stuff to, to shoot. So, like, I basically have to take over that job now. And I realized that I just had to really do that because I was trying to figure out who to get in this position. It's just, it's way too hard. I would say unless you just are paying someone like 200K a year to, like, be really good at that. But, yeah. Um, otherwise, yeah. So that's that's what I've been doing. I'm, like, literally editing the videos myself and everything. Um, so, but I do like being in the weeds on things. Like, I like, I like being on the ground um i think it's fun and you i feel like if i'm making sure that whatever i'm doing on the ground is like effective and having like a big roi then it's worth it for me to do that i mean you're a creative person so that's what you should be focusing yeah, your efforts on. exactly right? if you want to see more amazing interviews with successful entrepreneurs then check out this next interview right here i think you'll enjoy it and you'll definitely be inspired